So let's move to our next topic here of artificial intelligence, another one that is uh, stalking us all in a way that seems very, very scary. Um, and to help us sort through all of that, we are very, very happy to be joined by Belinda Lee, who's a PhD student at MIT working on natural language processing and machine learning. Belinda, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for having me. Um, and I, I'm just recovering from a cold, so apologies if I have a bit of a cough right now. No worries. No worries. I appreciate you joining us. And I guess I wanted to start not to sound like I'm some sort of congressman in the TikTok hearing, but uh, we talk a lot about artificial intelligence. It's so much sort of out there in the world that I actually wanted to start just by asking you, like, what what is AI? Like, what are we really talking about in a lot of these discussions? Because I think that can be an important framing. Yeah, for sure. Um, and I, I understand, like, I think the word AI is a very kind of um, large term. It's not exactly, you know, encapsulating exactly what's going on underneath. Um, so without getting into like much of the technical detail, um, a lot of these like systems like ChatGBT, um, like Dolly, they're trained to essentially kind of imitate humans, right? So GBT is what we call in the field, um, a large language model. Um, and a language model is simply a system that models the probability of the next word given everything that was said previously. Um, so you can think of it as like a giant statistical machine. If you feed it enough data, enough sentences, you eventually get a pretty good model or a pretty good imitation of what words typically, typically come next in a given context. Um, and it turns out if you scale this up to a massive amount of data, um, and if you use a huge model, um, so these are called large language models, um, you get this really fantastic distribution of text. Um, you've seen everything on the internet. Um, and you can do some pretty cool things, right? Obviously, you can't do everything. Um, but you can get a pretty good model of what like humans would typically say in a given context. Uh, you can like get GBT to you know write an email for you or like to write some sort of story. Um, but uh, once again, this is all like trained off of data that was scraped from the internet. Um, and this is kind of what is fueling the un current unprecedented hype. Um, so it's not actually, I would not call it actually like artificial intelligence, um, but what it's really doing is it's like really good at mimicking um, what humans have already put out there. And of course, you know, we keep seeing these sort of like doomsday predictions. One of them was by this so-called godfather of AI. I don't know if he's actually the godfather of AI or how he got that name. You could maybe tell, tell us more about that. But like warning that uh, it could end the world as we know it. Um, and others, you know, we keep see, seeing these sort of like, like I said, doomsday predictions about the worst that AI could do. It could destroy humanity. And then that's like the most of it. And then the other complaints are more like, you know, I, I have a lot of college professor friends who are like really irritated with the fact that like, it's really hard to deal with plagiarism now because it's like so easy to, you know, uh, have like some form of AI create your sources and like write some of your paragraphs and it's hard to find because it hasn't been written before necessarily. So, I mean, that's a pretty broad spectrum of the problems with this sort of technology. But from your vantage point, like what's a realistic view of what the potential harm could be from all of this? For sure, yeah. Um, and thanks for bringing that up because, um, well, Jeffrey Hinton is, is a very important figure in AI, certainly, but I think he's also been kind of sidelined by a lot of the like um, Silicon Valley hype around AI currently. Um, and I think a lot of what is being pushed right now by these um, like kind of AI influencers, a lot of these people are on social media, um, they're really pushing this hype of like, you know, AI, they come from, there's a lot of, um, there's a philosophy of long-termism that is kind of driving this sort of push, this sort of hype for like, you know, there's going to be a super intelligent AI that kills us all, et cetera. Um, and what they're really doing here is they're, first of all, like um, pushing this sort of narrative to try and hide kind of the real current harms of AI. Um, and it's really great because you can kind of just make up whatever you want um, as to what the long term like, harms of AI uh, are and say that, like, you know, we really deal with these issues rather than the current issues of like worker exploitation, of climate change, et cetera. Um, and the other thing is, these, this sort of hype also generates a lot of like revenue, a lot of profit for these companies as well, because 
uh, what you're essentially doing is you can say that like you know AI you can cast AI as much more powerful than it actually is currently, um, and that generates you know, a lot more hype and a lot more investment money um, into these models. Um, but what I th I would identify as kind of like some key pitfalls of AI currently is um, uh, first of all I agree that like um, the AI will have tremendous impact on the labor market um, going mm -hmm. forward. And it is something that we see currently um, in the WGA strikes, for example. Um, we see that uh, uh, companies, um, CEOs are rushing to really try and use AI to, you know, continue to exploit workers or replace workers um, and try to make them redundant. Even if they're not quite there yet, they want to use this technology to, like, you know, continue to exploit workers. Um, and furthermore, um, there's also, there's a great paper by uh, Emma Strubel that goes into kind of like the negative uh, climate impacts of training these large models. Um, currently to train these large models, you need a lot of compute and that co that is very costly and also damages the environment. Um, and other things include like, um, if we want to deploy these models, for example, to, you know, write news articles or to like, you know, Bing is deploying them for search. Um, these models, oftentimes, they don't stick to the facts. Like they can hallucinate. Um, they're, they're trained to, you know, mimic human data, but they're not trained to actually like vet, you know, the factuality of what they're spitting out. They're kind of like parrots in that sort of way. Um, and because of that, like we see that like they oftentimes give you misleading information, um, unfactual information, and this can have like. Know, tremendous negative impact if people are actually trusting what these language models are saying. You know, one of the things that what you just said raises, I think, uh, maybe one of the bigger questions here that I don't often see in the mainstream is, you know, I mean, of course, there's a the technology in and of itself, but of course, you know, all technology is deployed by humans in some way, shape, or form. I mean, so is, is the issue as much uh, the technology, or let me put it like this, is the issue as much sort of our regulatory frameworks and why people are deploying AI in certain reasons as much as the technology itself? Um, because I think sometimes it's sort of technology is just presented neutrally, like this thing is bad and will be bad no matter what. And I wonder if it's really that or just the way that the framework in which it's deployed currently in our society. Yeah, I, I really think that it is the way that like, it is deployed in our society currently. I think this technology has, you know, very radical or very, a very good possibility of being used in ways that are like useful for humanity and useful for workers. But because of like, you know, the capitalist society that we live in, th this technology is currently under the control of like CEOs and under the control of, um, you know, the investments, uh, uh, people who invest in these things. And, what they're doing is they're using this technology to actually line their pockets rather than, you know, actually help workers. Um, and I think there are ways that, like, you know, this technology can be used as tools to make, you know, our work more efficient, um, to like automate menial tasks or like really like uh, dangerous tasks. Um, but what we're seeing there, them being used for instead is actually to, you know, replace workers and to make people redundant um, and to instead of like shortening our work days, um, they're used to like make one person take on the task of 10 other people and then you're firing these 10 other people. Um, so I think it really is like a question of just society as it is today, um, rather than like this technology is inherently going to be used for evil. I wanted you to elaborate on that for a moment because I think sometimes like now that we're actually getting to the root of it here, which is the problem is actually we have a capitalist system that will use any form of technology to try to further exploit workers, pay them less or have fewer to pay. Um, and then, you know, and that's, that's the fear here, but in a different world, like you mentioned some of the possibilities of like, Oh, you wouldn't have to do menial tasks. You could shorten the workday. Like what could, let's say in a socialist world, right? What could AI be used for in a positive, beneficial way under a system that, unlike capitalism, actually tried to benefit human beings rather than try to exploit them for, you know, the profit of a few? Yeah, yeah. Um, that's a very good question. And, you know, I, I don't have a full vision of that yet because we're not there yet. But <laughs> I would hope that, like, this technology, <laughs> I mean, I hopefully one day, but I, I, I think this technology can be used, um, again, to, like, you know, 
make our labor um, both more, you know, more interesting. We can automate the work that, like, you know, the menial tasks, like, um, let's say, sorting through a bunch of data or sorting through a bunch of emails, um, the stuff you do every day that, like, takes up time and is not very fulfilling, and, you know, give us more time to actually do the fulfilling tasks um, that, you know, we want to do as human beings, right? Um, and I think, like, we can also see, like, um, uh, I think what is really essential here is like not just you know regulating this company, uh, these companies, but having like these models actually be in, be in the like have owner like have people have ownership of these models. Um, like the ownership of these models should be in the hands of the people, um, because uh, effectively what regulate like companies always have an incentive to drive towards profit, um, and so regulation is always going to be like react uh, reactive um, rather than like proactive, um, and what hopefully we could envision is like actually people coming together and being able to decide like, you know, what sorts of technologies do we want to build that helps humanity and how do we want to build it? Um, how much like do the benefits outweigh the harms and risks here on the climate? Um, you know, like is, is there any risk to, you know, deploying these technologies in the education sector where they can be used to like for plagiarism, et cetera, um, and actually have that be like a collective decision made by, you know, the people rather than like a select few powerful corporate entities. No, well, that certainly sounds better than where we are right now. I will say that for sure. Uh, I, I mean, let me just ask you this, Belinda. I, I mean, what is, is uh, as much as there are, are sort of negative externalities going on here, I mean, are there things happening around AI existing right now that you are excited about that maybe people should, you know, know more about as opposed to only looking at one side of it? Yeah, for sure. Um, some things that I think are very um, exciting. Um, well, I think generally, like, you know, the technology itself is definitely very exciting and very transformative. Um, but, you know, currently it's being driven by, you know, these corporations for profit. It's being kind of closed off to people. Um, wh what researchers are trying to do right now is, um, so OpenAI is like, uh, at least when they entered this uh, field, they started closing off a lot of these models and closing off source codes. They started privatizing and like driving towards profit, right? Um, and what a lot of researchers are trying to do now is trying to create open source replicas, you know, so that we can actually, you know, have like have a competitor first of all to um, like these giant ChatGPT like models, um, be able to like uh, make make sure that the like you know. That it's not like just monopolized solely by open AI. Um, so I think those efforts are very exciting um, and it would help democratize, you know, the control of these models to at least, you know, a bigger, uh, at least the broader public rather than just within um, these companies. Um, other things I think are exciting are like you know, applications to robotics, um, especially because like there's a lot of physical labor out there that's like dangerous or requires a lot of precision or is very, um, you know, requires a lot of backbreaking physical labor and that kind of stuff. I think could benefit from um, automation. Um, and yes, I, I also think that like um, there's applications uh, as well to you know organizing and like I'm a labor organizer and I know that like I scrape through you know a ton of data every day to try and like you know figure out um you know who to talk to and where you know would be good to like start organizing and I think that kind of stuff can also be automated. Mm -hmm. Belinda Lee, PhD student at Massachusetts Institute of Technology working on natural language processing and machine learning. Thank you for giving us some of your time here on the Freedom Side. Thank you.